Good morning, church. How are we doing on this gorgeous summer day? Aren't we blessed? Amen. And welcome to all of you at home or watching us online. We are so happy that you're able to join us uh, as you continue in fellowship with us. And so we're here today just uh, celebrating and worshiping our God um, under the glorious uh, sun and uh, just uh, shades of the trees that he has given us and so we do rejoice in our Lord and we thank you that this is the day that he has made and so we will rejoice and be glad in it 
Uh, today, just a couple of quick announcements. Is, uh, our youth mission trip kids are coming back today and are uh, scheduled to be rolling in around 1 or 2 o'clock. So we'll uh, continue to pray for them. Uh, my men's Bible study, we're going to be meeting at Perkins uh, this Thursday at 6.30. So you're all welcome to join us there. Uh, there's another uh, youth uh, hiking event on the 31st of July. And just a reminder that our church is closed on uh, Fridays during the month of July. Um, and uh, we've been blessed to have some wonderful help also filling in for Cindy as she's uh, been away with uh, her recovery from her surgery. Um, and so we are thankful for all that God has given us. And so with that, uh, let us begin now to worship our Lord and Savior in spirit and in truth. And I will ask you to stand for our uh, opening hymns. We'll be singing, Stand Up and Bless the Lord, and I Will Sing of the Mercies. And if you don't have a, a hymn sheet in front of you, uh, Camille is walking around and we'll pass those out. So let us stand together as we lift our praise to our God. God. Our Lord in heaven, we do sing to your mercies today. We will sing tomorrow. We will sing our whole lives long for the blessings that you bring. Lord, you are our manna that has come down from heaven to watch over us, to guide us, to sustain us, and to lead us. 
today as we feel your warmth, as we see your glory in the sky and the trees around us. Lord, let us give mercies to you. Let us praise you and honor you with our worship. And so, Lord Jesus, we come to you today and we ask that you will enter into our worship. Fill us with your spirit and guide us in your truth and your word. And so we offer this in your name. And we pray to you. Amen. You may be seated now as we enter into our morning scripture. We are looking at John 6, verses 30 through 35. We're going to shorten our passage this morning. But this is Christ's passage in which he proclaims one of his great I am statements. And he says, I am the bread of life. Today we will explore the account in Exodus of how God rained down from heaven the bread uh, that would sustain his people for 40 years. But today we are told about, through the words of Christ, of how the bread of heaven will sustain us throughout eternity. And so let us hear now the words that are given to us by Jesus Christ. And he said to them, what are they said to him? What sign are you going to give us then so that we may see it and believe you? What work are you performing? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As is, is it is as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And then Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it was my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. So we praise God for his word this morning. Amen.
Amen. Thank you, Ted and Dick, for sharing with us this morning. Uh, what a blessing that is to, to have you uh, lifting your voice up in one of my favorite songs. So uh, thank you for that. It is time in our service now in which we come before our God and share our joys, our concerns, and we lift up the prayers for the people and for this community and uh, all of creation. So I would ask if there are any uh, prayers that we would like shared this morning, and any joys or concerns. Yes, Lynette. Okay, so we'll be praying for Christine Hegel. Uh, she is out um, uh, in boot camp and serving our country, and just a blessing for what she is doing. Um, she has a young family at home, and so we'll pray for them as well. Uh, pray for Jake, who's uh, dealing with the four little ones, and uh, uh, but we know that God is uh, faithfully providing. So thank you for sharing. Yes. Okay, well, we'll pray for Helen, who's been hospitalized, but we pray for a good recovery and that gets back in, in good shape. Uh, Virginia? Yes, that's a blessing and a blessing to you and the, uh, the teachers as well that have uh, helped them through this. And we do uh, praise for the children and youth of our community who are able to make up their credits uh, for law school that occurred this past year because of COVID. And um, we'll continue to, to lift up uh, that entire um, area in our lives. So, yes, Gloria. Okay, well, we'll pray for uh, Daisy Larson's family as she has passed at the age of 97 um, and was just a wonderful soul that blessed many with all that she did. So lift her up. Okay, anything else? And I believe we are celebrating a 50th wedding anniversary. Is that correct? So... Let's uh, lift up a little praise to the lenses. Uh, Mark and Nancy, we celebrate their 50th anniversary. So, um, and I don't know how that got into the bulletin. So, yeah, I don't either. Little birdie. Uh, you got to watch out for those birds sometimes. So let us uh, go before our Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly God, we do thank you for all that you are in our lives. As the song says, you are our all and all. In you there is no want, there is no unmet need, there is no 
journey that has, is not being led by you. And so, God, we praise you for your provisions that you give us on a daily basis that will sustain us for not just the day in front of us, but for the days that go before us. We thank you for all the blessings that you provide. And we praise you, Lord, for uh, indeed the bread that you have given us through Jesus Christ, a bread that sustains and saves us uh, throughout our lives. And so, Lord, we thank you for that. But, God, we also know that there are still many issues and struggles that we face. And so we ask that you will hear us now in a time of silent meditation as we come before you, giving you our hearts, our thoughts, and our minds. Hear our prayers, O Lord. God, we thank you for responding to these needs and now hear us as we lift up these prayers that have been named before us today. We pray for your traveling mercies upon your our mission trip uh, kids and adults as they um, are driving back to Austin today. I just protect them and we praise you for a blessed week of service and fellowship that they've experienced Lord, we continue to lift up Jim Lura, recovering from surgery, as well as uh, Tina, Susan Stolo's sister, and Cindy Jays, as they are recovering from their surgeries. Uh, we lift up Kent Simonson, who's dealing with uh, pneumonitis, and would like prayers for his cancer to uh, continue to shrink. We pray for Michelle Simonson Gawanewski. Uh, whose cancer has metastasized into her liver. We pray for your protection for her. Uh, we lift up Dan and Maxine Long's son, Jason, who is recovering from his knee surgery after his very serious car accident uh, back in 2020 and uh, to this additional surgery that was needed. And I, I pray, Lord, that he will continue to recover um, from uh, just that experience. Uh, Lord, we lift up the uh, Daisy Larson family. Uh, 97 years of a, a life well lived um, is a glorious thing. And so we thank you for all that she means to so many. And we pray that you will comfort them in their loss today. Um, God, we pray for Helen, who has been hospitalized and just asks for a full recovery and that she can return to her normal vim and vigor. And we just ask for your, your strength for her. Uh, we lift up uh, Christine Hegel and thank you, God, for all that she is doing through boot camp and the way that she is mentoring others. And uh, we just ask for protection for her and um, as she um, will return soon. Uh, we also pray for her family too, Lord. God, we want to celebrate the joys of life. We thank you for all of the kids that have made up their credits that were lost. Uh, over a tough school year last year, uh, continue to bless them and the teachers that are pouring into them. Uh, we celebrate uh, in Virginia's their 30th anniversary, and today we celebrate with Mark and Nancy on their 50th anniversary, Lord. And just thank you for the example of love and life that they give to so many. Uh, and Lord, we also lift up our local soccer teams for the youth here that are doing so well up in state right now. And continue to bless them and um, protect them and uh, just watch over that experience as they uh, enjoy the competition that you've given them. And so, God, we praise you for, again, all that you do in our lives, and we thank you for the love that you share. And now we ask that you will hear us as we pray the prayer that Christ taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now I encourage you to always seek your hearts uh, to know how God is leading you to give. If you're led to give here, we ask uh, that you place your offerings in the back a box at our giving station. And also for those of you who are visitors, we welcome you and to our fellowship today. And we have a attached visitor sheet in your bulletins if you'd like to fill that out and put it in the box as well. And so we do thank you uh, for your presence and do want to make sure that you're welcome through this. And so now let us give to God all that he has given to us so that his people and his church will be blessed. Amen. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, help me stand. I am tired, I am weak, I am worn. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. When my way grows clear, precious Lord, linger near. When my life is almost gone, hear my cry, hear my call, hold my hand lest I fall. stand as we uh, greet our neighbors, uh, giving them the peace of Christ this morning. Well, as you begin to find your seats, and also we do have water back there if anyone ever needs it. 
uh, you can uh, go help yourself anytime during the service. Uh, but I will invite forward Ann Sundahl, who is leading our children's sermon today. And we're going to invite the children forward as well as you return to your seats. As you have a seat, um, again, Ann Sundahl is sharing with us our children's sermon today, and I feel like I want to pull up a little hey. <laughs> blanket here, but... Good morning. I'm so glad you came up. I'd have really been lonely if I didn't have anyone up here. Um, I bet you're excited about your sister coming home tonight, are you? Have you been missing her this week? Okay. Well, I brought a couple things up to share with you today. Do you like books? Well, I had this book in my classroom for a lot of years. It was one of the kids' favorite books. And it's called Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. Now, have you ever heard the weather person talk about when it starts to get cloudy, there's a chance of, what do you think there's a chance of? Rain. Rain, right, instead of meatballs. But it looks like this man is holding an umbrella. He's standing under a cloud and he's catching a meatball so it looks like it's raining meatballs now this is about it the story is about a town called chew and swallow and it's a little town and it doesn't have any grocery stores because they don't need grocery stores everything they they eat is supplied by the sky and anything they could possibly want in fact one of the pages, it shows it's raining down soup and juice. It's snowing mashed potato and peas. And the wind is blowing in hamburgers. <laughs> and the people of the town love their food until the weather takes a turn for the worse. And it starts raining down things like spaghetti. And do you see the headline? says spaghetti ties up town now this is a really silly book and if you want to take it and borrow it and find out maybe you have you seen the book okay it's a really funny book but you might say to yourself what does this have to do with today's Bible lesson if you could have any food rain down from the sky what would you like to have rain down from the sky what's your favorite one of your favorite foods Grant I was thinking maybe cookies or cake or even cinnamon rolls, something like that. Well, anyway, the food raining down from the sky, what does that have to do with today's story? Mike is going to preach from um, Exodus 16 about God's people in the wilderness. And you know what? They didn't have their favorite foods. They didn't even have any food. Um, and I just want to review a minute. I know I've been enjoying the children's sermons from the last couple weeks when Jody talked about God's comfort and Emma talked about God's protection last week. She did a great job. And today we're going to talk about God's provision. And provision means to provide, that God gives us what we need. And do you remember last week when Emma talked about the Red Sea? how God parted the Red Sea while the Israelites were trying to get away from the Egyptians. Remember that? Well, they got to the other side, and they were so happy. They were celebrating. They had gotten away from the Egyptians. But their journey to the Promised Land is now taking them through the desert. And there are no grocery stores, no fields, no crops growing. And the desert is hot. And you know what? They soon ran out of food. And you know what they did? They began to complain. They said to Moses, God brought us out of Egypt, and now we're just going to die of starvation? Why, we should have just stayed in Egypt and stayed slaves. I can't believe that we're going to die of hunger. Well, you know what? We have an amazing God. God told Moses, that he heard the people complaining and he would rain bread down from heaven. 
not like this silly make-believe book, right? But God really did. He would rain bread from heaven. And he sent a new food that the people had never seen before or tasted. And it appeared with the dew each morning. And it must have been kind of like bread or wafers, they say, with honey. Um, it was different from anything they ever tasted. And I have a couple pictures. They were so happy now because God was supplying food for them every day. And God also sent quail. Do you know what a quail is? That's right, JC. It's a type of bird, and I bet it tastes kind of like chicken. So these hungry Israelites that are wandering in the desert, and they actually wandered for a really long time, like 40 years, um, God provided food for them. And our God is a generous God, and he can perform miracles. He is the Lord our God Almighty, and we can trust him to give us what we need. So if you don't remember anything else about today's story, I want you to remember this. The Lord God took care of his people in the wilderness, just like he will take care of us today. And we can trust God to provide. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for your faithfulness. Thank you that we can trust you, and you will always be there for us. We love and praise your holy name, and thank you, God, for J.C. and Grant. Um, and I have a little baggie. Now, manna, I should have said manna means what is this, because the, the Israelites didn't even know what it was. But I have a, some manna for you to take back with you. Do you think it's manna? No, no it's vanilla wheat. But I want you to remember that God does provide what we need. So thanks so much for coming up, guys. I love you, too. Thank you, Ann. Um, thank you, kids. And I think you can go back with Emma now as you head back to your children's time um, and singing. And let's give a round of applause to Ann. That was wonderful. Thanks. And I don't know if you ever thought of this, but you probably could have had a career as a teacher. Oh. <laughs> and also, your mic is still on. I know. I'm trying to get it off. <laughs> okay. For me, and I know for the rest of you, we would desire that uh, maybe like broccoli or cauliflower would rain down upon us, wouldn't we? Well, that is, uh, and gave a, a wonderful account of our scripture today in which God truly is uh, providing for his people. And we see that uh, this will transfer over to all of us uh, through his son, Jesus Christ. And so we will um, continue the Exodus story. We're going to be reading from chapter 16, verses 11 through 18. And if you do have your Bibles, I'd encourage you to open up and open them up. And those at home uh, as well, if you can open up to Exodus 16, 11 through 18, where we find um, the simple account of how God provided for his people. So verse 11, the Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather as much of it as you need, an omer to a person according to the number of persons, all providing for those in their tents. The Lord did so, some gathering more, some less. But when they measured it with an omer, those who gathered much had nothing, 
nothing over, and those who had gathered little had no shortage. They gathered as much as each of them needed. So we praise God again for His Word this morning. Amen. Well, uh, with our scripture today and the fact that our own mission trippers are driving home today, I'm reminded of all the trips that I've taken over the years of ministry. And I can see some people out there who have gone on these trips with me. Whether it's by van or by train or by plane, the hardest part of these trips for me, these mission trips, was actually the getting there and the coming home. I always thought the easiest part was after we had arrived and before we had left. The week of ministry, to me that was easy. But it was those one to two days of traveling that always created the most stress for me in these trips. The endless questions and complaints of where we're going, where are we going to eat, where are we going to stay, and my favorite, and I've gotten this from both youth and adults, I've really got to go to the bathroom. <laughs> and my answer was always, well, it's just about five more minutes. And in the relativity of time, it, uh, I was never lying. And so these were the things that always kept me up as I was planning for these trips. And as hard as I tried to map out travel plans and bathroom stops and restaurants that could accommodate 20 to 25 mostly hungry and rowdy teenagers, I never felt like I totally mastered these parts of the journey. For me, it was the logistics that were always the struggle. And I only had 25 people for a week. But then I consider our friend Moses. He had to deal with over 2 million people traveling around the wilderness, not for a week, but for 40 years. Can you get the, the understand the, the depth of that? Two million people traveling in the wilderness for 40 years. The logistics for him must have been mind-blowing. But the logistics for our God is just another miraculous act. I believe that this is one of the key parts of this story that is most often overlooked. It was how God provided for his people during their time, during their journey. And it was a miracle that emanated from God's love, God's care, and God's protection for those that he cherished. So we're going to take a closer look at this account and see how God provided for his people for over 40 years. For we know that last week, as we had heard already, that uh, we focused on the parting of the Red Sea. God had allowed his people to escape their enemies and to be freed from their 400 years of oppression and captivity. But then, once they have left Egypt, now the struggle of the journey begins. But thankfully, we have a miraculous Lord who loves logistics. And if you look at the depth of the people who traveled, the number of animals, the equipment, the supplies that had to be involved, it would have been a marvel even in today's standards to pull something like that off. But God did it. God provided. God cared for his people throughout this journey. And all he called them to do was to faithfully believe and trust after him. Listen to what he says at the end of chapter 15 as they have emerged from their oppression. He says, if you listen carefully to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep his decrees, I will not bring on any of you the diseases I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. See here, the God of the covenant has made another promise to his people. 
a promise to protect him wherever they may be. But as we will see time and time again, the Hebrew people constantly complained. They challenged and they tried to turn away from their God. As soon as things started to look bleak. And this is where our scripture lands us today. In the 16th chapter, we hear from what God tells Moses. Listen in verses 11 and 12. The Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the Israelites. Now, I'd be okay if they started grumbling maybe a year or two years, ten years down the road. But this is only one month after they had seen the greatest miracle ever, the parting of the Red Sea, being released from their captivity. Only a month into their journey, they began to complain. Verse, or chapter 15, when they were thirsty, they said, when they came tomorrow, they could not drink its water because it was bitter. And they called the place Mara. So the people grumbled against Moses, saying, what are we to drink? And then in chapter 16, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt, there we sought, sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us into the desert to starve to death. Now, I'm sure I'm not alone, but when I read this, I really struggle with their lack of faithfulness that I see in God's children. It was only a month later when God had delivered them. But now, as soon as they begin to feel the, uh, the pangs of hunger and the dryness in their throats, they act as if those saving events had never happened. And arrogantly, I think to myself, I would never do something like that. And so this morning, the first question I want us all to answer is, do the Israelites have a right to complain? Is what they're saying justified? Should we look with them with disdain or should we see them as believers who were trying to make sense of all that was happening? At the most, most basic of levels, I believe it's right for us to see the Israelites and to struggle with their lack of faith. But as we look deeper, we can begin to see that there was still a hopefulness in their complaints. The Israelites trusted God so much that they expected that He would not only deliver them from their captivity, but that He would sustain them on their journey. Even in their struggles, God's children remained present. They were willing to seek the one who would ultimately provide for them. Their initial complaints reveal both their flaws and their faithfulness, their arrogance and their submission, their best and their worst. Now, we might have a hard time of accepting this duality that we see in the Israelites. But if we're honest with ourselves, we can see that same duality in each one of us. For we all have our own areas of hunger and thirst that drive us to the irrational thought that God can no longer provide for us that He will not sustain us. As we fast forward hundreds of years, we see this same irrationality with the followers of Christ. If we know the story in John, this occurred just after Jesus had fed the 5,000 with scraps, with basically the table scraps from a, a shepherd boy. And here they are, they are complaining and they are demanding for a sign. They want further affirmation of who Jesus Christ is. Verse 31 in John says, Our ancestors ate, our ancestors ate the bread, the manna that the world that came down from heaven. 
And now we want the bread that you can give us. They wanted the physical bread. They wanted to be fed by their God. But Jesus clarifies their request with two statements. He reminds them that first, the bread was not from Moses. It was from God in heaven. And secondly, he reminds them that what they need the most is the spiritual bread that Christ provides. It is that which gives eternal life. So I believe that the Israelites, the followers of Christ, and all of humanity, that we have a right to cry out to God, to cry out to heaven for the blessings that he can provide. As we are hungry, as we are thirsty, we need to go to our Lord and ask for his provisions. For the Israelites, it was the manna and the quail. But now for all of humanity, it was Jesus Christ, the bread of life, the one who provides. So we need to cry out as well. God, send down your bread from heaven to provide for us. And he has done so in our Savior and our Lord. And now we are given the task of collecting that bread and allowing it to sustain our lives and to guide us forward. And then the second question we need to ask is, what did the Israelites truly need? Their greatest struggle was not that they didn't have any food. Their greatest struggle was that they lacked the faith that God had given them the reason to have. Even with all that God had done for them, they still lacked the faith to know that God would provide for their safety. He would meet their hunger. He would provide for their long journey. And he would give themselves to him. And he would take them away from Satan that was trying to oppress them. This is what they needed. They needed the faith to overcome their doubts. They were struggling in the wilderness. And they needed to believe that God was always there. For as they struggled, their doubts turned into disbelief, which turned into defiance and denial. And we all know that dance that, that causes us to ultimately turn away from our God. We wonder why God has led us into our wildernesses, only to be confronted with pain, with illnesses, with the struggles. Why would God abandon us in our greatest time of need, we ask? But we must not let these doubts turn into disbelief. We cannot use current circumstances or past situations to lead us towards defiance. Or denying that God is not even real. It is our faith that overcomes the doubts. It is our looking back on the roadmaps of life in which we're reminded of how God has cared for each one of us. He is present. He provides. Now for me, like many of us, I can look back in the course of my life. And I can see how God's greatest accomplishments have come out of my deepest hurts. I have been in the desert, just like the Israelites, just like all of us. I have called out, why have you let me down this path only to be burdened by pain and heartache? I've walked through unfulfilling jobs, destructive relationships, heartbreaking losses, I have doubted God and said, why have you led me here? I have lived through those dark nights of hopelessness and despair. But I have also time and time again awoken in the morning 
to see underneath the dew the provisions that God gives, the bread of heaven that has come down into my life through the power, power of the Holy Spirit. And I am filled up again. I am restored. I am renewed. That is how God provides for all of us. In our needs, He gives us hope. And that hope comes through Jesus Christ. And finally, our final question is, what is this daily bread that God is giving them? He has provided for their needs with a daily bread. For the Israelites, it was manna. That's what God poured out to his people. Uh, and showed us, I didn't realize it looked like vanilla wafers. But, you know, I could kind of see. I could do 40 years worth of vanilla wafers every morning. But God provided manna. It is only described in Exodus 16 and Numbers chapter 11. It is described as a fine flake-like thing. It was white. It looked like bdellium. It had the shape of coriander seed. And every morning the Israelites would walk around and they would gather this up. Now, I don't know for you, but growing up hearing these Bible stories, I always have in my mind's eye of how I think things actually happened. And so for the longest time, I envisioned this as every morning the Israelites would get up and there'd be large, warm, freshly baked loaves of sourdough bread um, that they would all collect uh, and that would sustain them. But this wasn't what this was. This was manna from heaven. It was something like they had never seen. And now God was blessing them with this. But he gave them only enough to meet their daily needs. They had to go out every morning to collect. If they didn't, when the frost wore off, the, the heat of the day and the sun would burn up the manna that was placed before them. They were called to faithfully respond every day to collect what God has given it says in Scripture in, in further parts of chapter 16 that if they gathered too much, if they tried to get enough to sustain them for the next day and the next day, um, that in the evening um, it would melt away and it would become uh, corrupted uh, with the bugs of the ground and it would become rancid and it was nothing that any of them could eat. And so God tells them, I want each person to gather an omer which is roughly two quarts of manna. Two quarts to sustain them for that day. No more, no less. And on the sixth day, they were, to, they were called to collect double portions so they would not have to work on the Sabbath. So they collected only their daily bread. And I wonder, why couldn't they collect more? Wouldn't it have been more efficient to gather a, a week's worth or a year's worth? Isn't that what we all do when we go to Costco? We come home with a five-gallon tub of mayonnaise. That lasts us until eternity. It would be more efficient. But God doesn't call us to efficiency. God calls us to faithfulness. You know, if they would have been able to collect more than they needed that day, they would have eventually thought that they were the ones caring for themselves, that they could provide for their own needs simply by uh, managing the resources, being efficient. But God calls them to be faithful, to follow after Him and to trust that He will provide. Their collecting of the food was not, not just a physical act. It was a spiritual act of worship. Because they were traveling around, they were walking around, and they were trusting that God would meet their need today. Not tomorrow, not next week. Today, God would provide. Every day for 40 years, 365 days a year, I did the math, 
That's 14,600 times that they went out every morning and God showed them his miraculous power. Over 14,000 times God said, I am here for you. I will take care of you. I will provide for you. Do you know when the manna stopped? Verse 35 tells us, it says the Israelites ate manna for 40 years until they came to the land that was settled. They ate manna until they reached the border of Canaan, the promised land. God had finally led them to the promised location of where he wanted them to flourish. And the manna stopped because now was God was making another provision. He gave them a land of plenty to meet their needs, to supply their wants. That's our message, is that God will give us enough to get through um, the, the lives that we live. But at the end of the journey, we are going to step into God's heavenly kingdom and we will receive the eternal blessing of the land that he has given us. Scripture says that Christ has gone before us to prepare a place for each one of us. The bread of life sustains us day after day after day. But now the bread of life is preparing all eternity for us. That's what our God has done. That is the goodness of our Lord and Savior. For we know that God provides for his people. He pours down upon us the provisions of his grace and his mercy. And he sustains us as we faithfully follow after him. Amen. Now let us stand as we sing our closing hymn, Fairest Lord Jesus. Lorraine hates this when I do this to speak before singing, but I'm going to do it anyway. This hymn contains a word that many of us use in a way different than it is used here. It speaks of Christ being fair. This does not mean he is impartial or right. Many of you know this, but some of you might not. This word fair means beautiful, and fairest means most beautiful. And in thinking about the passage in the Exodus, when Christ, by his power, provides for his people, he desires to do so and is most beautiful in person by his graces and mercies each morning, is most beautiful in his care for today and is most beautiful in his provision for tomorrow and forever. So sing with that thought in mind or you are singing the wrong hymn. Join me.
Amen. Thank you for sharing, David. That uh, does give us a, a new view of that hymn. Jesus is brighter. Jesus is purer. Let us go forth with that presence in our hearts and our minds, trusting in the glory of God and the presence of the Holy Spirit and the love of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Let us go forth in His name. Amen. Back there in the form of donuts. So stop in and enjoy. <laughs>